Happy Sabbath. Let's see, I'm looking forward to this word and getting right into it. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day and we thank you for your word. And I just ask that you, your presence would be with us, Lord, that these words would be your words and that you would touch our hearts, that we would grow and learn and just be brought into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, reaching out to the lost. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Back to the Future is a 1985 science fiction adventure comedy starring Michael, Michael J. Fox. It was released on July 3rd in 1985, and it was the highest grossing film for that particular year. And it basically is a movie about a teenager who in 1985 goes back in time to 1955, and he meets up with his parents, who are at that time teenagers. Now the story is a comedy adventure, and ultimately results in, when he goes back to 1985, his family is in a better situation than it was before. Now, and it's all done in style, in this, in this DeLorean car, made up like a time machine. Have you heard of the movie? Have you seen the movie? You've heard of it? Okay, when I first saw it back in 1985, I was fascinated by the idea and concept of time travel. And I used to talk to my friends, hey, if you had a time machine, where would you go? What time period would you go to see? Or who would you want to talk to in history? And I would say, oh, I would love to go back to maybe the Roman times and, and during the time of Jesus and interact and see what was going on at that time. Or I, I know another time period I was always fascinated with was the medieval time period, to see the knights and the castles and everything that was going on at that time. But then I started thinking, what about more practical? If I had a time machine, what if I just went back in time 30 years and just said to myself, why don't you buy Apple stock? Or why don't you buy Walmart stock? I could just see the conversation I would have with my father saying, Dad, you've got to buy this Apple stock. It's really going to take off in the future. He'd probably look at me going, what are you talking about, son? But this idea of time travel is fascinating to me. And what I want to do is I want to point out to you in the Bible that that's what I want to talk to you about. There's a story in the Bible how God actually turned back time. It wasn't a time machine, but he actually turned back time. The title of this message is Hezekiah's Prayer and Pride. But in this story, we're going to see that God actually moves the sun backwards in the sky. And it's a sign to King Hezekiah that he's going to be healed. But the sign just wasn't for Hezekiah. Okay, from this story, I promise you, in the next 20 minutes, you're going to take away a powerful perspective of how this story is relevant to your life today. And I want to draw out just two major points up from this story. One is God's outreach to the world. His desire to reach out to those who don't know him yet. It's his mission. And the second point that I want to draw out from this story is whether or not we're going to choose to cooperate with his mission to reach out to the world. Now, this story is found in 2 Kings chapter 20. I'm not going to have all the scripture verses up here, so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open it up. We're going to walk through this story and draw out these two points. Now, Second Kings chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20. Now, I want to give you the background of this story. Sorry, these slides are a little out of order. That threw me off. Um, I want to give you the background of this story. And Hezekiah is king of Judah. Now, you have to understand at this time, the kingdom is split. There's a northern kingdom, and there's a southern kingdom. And to give you background, Hezekiah is in the prime of his life. He's 39 years old. He has been exceptionally blessed by the Lord. God gave him very great wealth, very great honor, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Okay? Now, that's an important point to make because if you look at all the kings from the north, of the northern kingdom of Israel, all of them 
did evil in the sight of the Lord. They disobeyed God except Jehu. There was one time where he did something good. But all the kings were evil. They didn't follow up the Lord. In the southern kingdom, though, that's where Hezekiah was from, in Judah, most of them did evil. But there was a handful of kings that actually did good. Hezekiah was one of them. And Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. The Bible says that he was like no other kings before him or even those after him. He held fast to the Lord, kept his commandments, and the Lord was with him and prospered with him wherever he went. Okay, now the basic story is this. Hezekiah becomes mortally ill. He prays to the Lord, and the Lord heals him. But the Lord shows him a sign, and that sign is moving the sun backwards in the sky. That was the sign because Hezekiah wanted to make sure that he was going to be healed, and he said, show me a sign, Lord, and that's the sign that he gave him. And then we find that the king of Babylon sends ambassadors to Hezekiah with a present, basically congratulating on his healing. That's the basic outline of the story. Let's go ahead and start to break this apart and see what actually happens more specifically in this story. Okay? Second, I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 20, starting in verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle of the court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, The God of your father David, I have heard your prayers. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. That's amazing right there. That's the opening part of this particular story. Now think about this. Isaiah the prophet comes to Hezekiah and says, set your house in order, you're going to die. This is coming from Isaiah. That is a credible source. That is an authentic source. That is an authoritative source of information. And he's saying, thus says the Lord, you're going to die. And he's basically saying, write your last will and testament. Write your will out. Tell, tell folks when you die who you're going to give it to. And also, appoint your successor. That's essentially what Isaiah is saying to him. Now, Hezekiah is 39 years old at this time. He's at the prime of his life. The Lord has blessed him with riches. And he is with honor as well. But what does Hezekiah do? He cries out to the Lord. He cries out to the Lord and he says, Remember, Lord, I've, I've been with you. I've trusted you. I, I, I've walked after you. I've done what is good in your sight. This is all true statements. And he wept bitterly. And before I even get to my first point in this opening thing, what I want to point out to you is prayer matters. No matter what your circumstances are, pray. It doesn't matter what you're going through in your life. And this is what we can't, we, we have to make sure we don't fall into this trap. Don't resolve yourself to your situation. Meaning, nothing is final until it actually happens. Some people, you may, may contract cancer. Oh, I'm, I'm a goner, I'm dead. I, I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll write my last will and testimony. That's it. Or, you know what, I've lost my job, I'll be homeless. That's it. That's, that's, that's my destiny. Or my marriage is on the rocks, it's not going well, I'm going to be divorced, it's, I'm going to be single the rest of my life. No. This opening paragraph right here says nothing is final until it's final. And Hezekiah reaches out to the Lord. Even though this source came from Isaiah, a credible source. Hezekiah is banking on the mercy of God. And what happens? God answers his prayer. That's amazing. I just want to point this out. Prayer matters. Prayer matters. And we need to realize God is compassionate and merciful, and he does so in Hezekiah's life. And adds 15 years to his life. 
Because he prays. Okay, now, let's see what Hezekiah does next. I'm, I'm reading from verse, uh, verse 8. Pick it up in verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 8. It says, Now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? And that, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me? And that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day. Isaiah said, This shall be the sign for you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or go back ten steps? So Hezekiah answered, It is easy for the shadow to decline ten steps, but no, let the shadow turn backward ten steps. Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord. He brought the shadow on the stairway back ten steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Now, I find it interesting that, Isaiah, uh, that Hezekiah actually asks, What will be the sign? He says, what's the sign? Tell me the sign that for sure I'm going to be healed. I mean, should he just trust in the word of the Lord from Isaiah? It's like, he said, you'll heal me. But no, he asked for a sign. And, and notice that God picks the sign for him. You see that? He says, tell me which way, what it's going to be. Shall the shadow decline ten steps? Or shall the shadow turn backwards 10 steps? Will it go forward 10 steps or will it come back 10 steps? The Lord picks the sign. Now I find it interesting that this is a pretty big sign. I mean, to have the shadow of the sun move back 10 steps. Now I know sometimes people think that this was a sundial and that it moved back 10 degrees. Okay, and they calculate that it would have moved back in the sky 40 minutes. Okay, but I don't think the way we read the text of the Bible, it's actually talking about a sundial. Because it talks about the stairways. It's stairways. Do you want this shadow to go backwards 10 steps or forward 10 steps? And Hezekiah says, yeah, make it go backwards 10 steps. That would be, that would be a very good sign. Because we know the sun only moves in one direction. And I should say... It appears to us that it moves in one direction, right? The Earth, we know, the Earth is rotating constantly from east to west. So we only see the sun going in one direction, right? Only goes in one direction. And so I think this sign was significant. I think going the past the 10 steps, going backwards, I think it went from one part of the sky to the other part of the sky. I can't prove that to you in the Bible, but I think it was that significant that it could have been, I don't know, Two or three in the afternoon, and all of a sudden it turns to 9 a.m. in the morning. Whoa, that would have been significant. Okay? But why such a big sign? I mean, think about this. I mean, remember when Moses asked the Lord, what, what sign will you give me that I know I'm supposed to go to your people? And he says, take your staff and throw it down. And it became a serpent. And Moses ran away. Why couldn't God just give him some simple sign, a local sign? And he would have been able to say, wow, that's, that's really amazing. God is really speaking to me, and he confirmed it through this sign. I mean, why did he do that? Why did he use, like, remember Gideon? Gideon asked the question, Lord, do you really want me to go out and battle the enemy? Are you really going to be with me? Because if you're really going to be with me, I'm going to place this fleece out. And if in the morning it's wet and the ground is dry around it, then... I'll know that you're with me. And God does that. And then, we, why wouldn't God use something like that? But he makes this sign global. I mean, if, this, if the shadow moves back, 10 steps. If the shadow moves back 10 steps, is that just something that you, and that us here in Maryland would be able to notice if God did that? No, if the shadow goes back, it's going back across the whole world. That's the way it works. We're going to see why God used this sign. Let's finish the rest of this story. Pick it up in verse 12. And I'll show, I'm just showing you one of the verses here. Pick it up in verse 12. It says, At that time, Berodach Baladon, a son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. 
Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all the treasure in his house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in him all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah sent, then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Last two verses. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Now, this is interesting. Isaiah said, Hezekiah said, he prays to the Lord. The Lord heals him, shows him a sign. The sign is big. The sign is global. He moves the sun back in the sky. And then ambassadors from Babylon come to visit him. They come to visit him, and what happens? Hezekiah talks about the treasures in his storehouse and shows them all of his riches and treasures. Isaiah's like, what, who are these men? What, what? What are you doing? Tell me what's going on here. And he says, well, I showed him everything. I showed him all my riches and everything. And, and what does Isaiah say? Isaiah says, you know what? Your descendants are going to be taken off captive in Babylon. Now that right there should tell you something. Something's wrong in this story. Because of pronouncement by Isaiah saying, your descendants are going to be taken captive and they're going to serve as officials in the Babylonian kingdom. There's a couple more missing pieces to this story that we don't see in 2 Kings. We have to dig a little bit deeper. We have to go to 2 Chronicles 32. I want us to go to 2 Chronicles 32 and see the missing link here, okay? Then we're gonna tie this together and make these two major points that are directly relevant in your life today, okay? Take a look at 2 Chronicles 32, and I want to read verse 24 and 25 to you. I have one of the verses up on the screen. Verse 24 says, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore wrath came, up, came on him, and on Judah and Jerusalem. Now I find this absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Hezekiah is sick. He prays to the Lord. The Lord heals him. The Lord shows him a sign. And we have nothing of Hezekiah's record of how he's praising the Lord and thanking him for his healing. Amazing. I mean, he would, remember, Hezekiah is living 300 years past David. In fact, thank you, Mary, for reading that Psalms, Psalms 100. In fact, I just want to go back to it real quick. Go to Psalms 100. I want, I want you to see these two verses here. And this is so appropriate in terms of our message today, and I didn't even know Mary was going to have these verses here. But look at Psalms 100, and bear with me as I flip to it, as I find it in my Bible. Uh, Psalms 100, just the last two verses. I think this is amazing, because we have to remember when the Lord does something in our life, when the Lord moves upon our life and he expresses his compassion and mercy, this is what's happening. Psalms 100 verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. We don't see that coming from Hezekiah. From 2 Chronicles 32, we see him, his heart was proud. And he gave no thanks. He gave no return. Uh, he gave no return for the benefit that he received. That's that's part one of understanding what's going on in this story. The second part is this. Go to verse 31, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 31, and we'll get the rest of the story. And then we'll talk about it. Verse 31. 
It says, in fact, I have it up on the screen here. It says, even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. Amazing. Those ambassadors came to Jerusalem because of the wonder that they saw. They came to Jerusalem because of the sun. The, sky, the sun moved back in the sky. They came to inquire what happened. And they heard about the Hezekiah story. How he was sick. And how this sign was given. So they come to Jerusalem and well, they want to know what actually happened. And we have no record of Hezekiah interacting with them, telling them about his sickness, how he cried out to the Lord, and how God healed him. Nothing like that. In the story, when they come visit him, what does he do? He shows them all of his wealth. He shows them all of the things that he has, has obtained from the Lord. He shows his riches. He shows his treasury house. But he doesn't explain to them why the, the, sun, why the sun moved back in the sky. Now, think about this. Let's take a closer look at this wonder that the ambassadors came to Jerusalem to figure out. Did Hezekiah come up with the idea of this sign to move the sun's shadow backward? Did Hezekiah come up with that idea? No, he didn't. He only had the choice of it moving forward or backwards, okay? Do you think God knew that he would have chosen backwards? I think so. He knew Hezekiah was a sharp man, knew his stuff, and he said, you know what? He's going to choose backwards because the sun always goes in one direction, so moving it forward isn't, isn't any big deal. Move it backward. Move it backward, then I'll know that you're going to heal me. So God naturally says, okay, I'll do that. He moves the sun back in the sky. So he already knew. Did God already know also that this would be more than just a local wonder? Yes, he did. He knew that it would be a global wonder. And I want you to hear this point. Here's the first and main point, because it's very important because we understand the character of God through this story. Because if we miss this point, we miss the whole essence of Christianity and the heart of God towards unbelievers. But if we get this point, we will be better prepared to work alongside God in his mission to reach out to the world. You see, God reaches out to those who don't know him. God reaches out to those who don't know him. In this particular story, he's reaching out to the Babylonians. God chose the sun moving back in the sky because it would catch the Babylonians' attention. And see, the Babylonians would have taken this sign very seriously. At the time, they were the leading astronomers at the time in the land. In fact, all of Western astronomy today is established by the foundations that were established back in Babylonian times because they studied the skies and the stars and the sun and the celestial objects in heaven. That was their, that was their primary focus. In fact, God knew that this would catch their attention. He was speaking their language because they valued, they revered, and they worshiped these celestial objects, especially the sun and the moon, especially the sun and the moon. And God is demonstrating to them through this sign that there is a greater power behind the scenes. There's a, they thought that the power and the gods were the sun and the moon themselves. God is saying, no. I am actually the creator of these objects, and I can set them in orbit and move them according to my will. That's basically what God was saying to them. And so the Babylonians would have been, whoa, what is going on here? How could this happen? They only have known that the sun moves from east to west. That's all they know. And so, do you see the other point that I want to make is the Babylonians were not part of God's chosen and holy people. They were outsiders. They were from a far and distant land. It's true that this sign would have been to show Hezekiah that God would heal him. But it's also true that God was drawing 
the Babylonians to Jerusalem by this time. He was reaching out to them. I mean, why else would they have come to Jerusalem and inquired about Hezekiah's health? Because they saw the sign. And by coming to Jerusalem, they should have heard about the great, merciful, and compassionate God of Hezekiah. That's what they should have heard. They did not hear that. And that's why we need to recognize that in our daily lives, God is reaching out to those who don't know him. God is reaching out to those who are lost. That's his primary mission. He does not wish that any should perish. He uses his Holy Spirit to convict the world of their sin, not to condemn them, but to lead them to a Savior. That's God's primary mission. In fact, we may not know how God is using signs and working in the hearts of unbelievers. We may never know. Hezekiah had no idea, had no idea that this sign that he was more selfishly looking for, for his own healing, that God would use it to reach out to the Babylonians. He had no idea that was happening. We have no idea what God is doing and working in the hearts and minds of unbelievers. But he's touching their hearts. He's convicting them. He's drawing them to himself. Because we can't do that work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. In John 6, 44, it says, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God knows how to touch the heart. He knows how to convict someone where they're at. And I want to show you this. I want to show you this example in the New Testament of God's outreach ministry. Take a look at Mark 2. I don't have this up on the screen, but take a look at Mark 2, 14 through 17. This is talking about Jesus, and it says, And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house. In his house, the context is Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus is at Matthew, the tax collector's house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. That's why our scripture for today in Mark 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. You see, anytime you see Jesus doing something, saying something, he says, if you see me, you see the Father. Jesus is revealing God's character in everything that he does. And I think we can easily forget in the church, we can cocoon ourselves, so to speak, in the church and think that only God does things in the church. In the same way that Hezekiah was thinking, only God does things in Jerusalem to God's holy people. Okay, God's mission is to reach those that were lost, those that don't know Christ, those that don't know the power and compassion of God. Because the Pharisees are upset with Jesus. He's, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. He's eating with, and he's, they're like, why, why, do you, why does he do this? Because the Pharisees were like, we need to separate ourselves from them. No, we need to stay away from them. They're no good. And if you look around in the world, many people do not know God. They do not know Christ. They do not know of, of his loving, compassionate son who's in this Bible right here. They don't know it. And let me ask you this. If you look around the world, you would, I would ask you this question. Do you see those people as lost? Or do you see those people as those who Jesus came to seek and to save? Two different ways of looking at it. Because if you just see them as lost, you're unlikely to interact with them. You're unlikely, you're like, more likely to act like the Pharisees. Oh, we don't want to have anything to do with you. When Jesus himself sits and dines with them and interacts with them. God's character is outreach to seek and save the lost. Let me ask you this question. In light of this tragedy that happened a week ago, just one week ago in Orlando, I would ask you this question. 
Do you see them as lost? Or do you see them as people who Jesus came to seek and to save? Two different things. Vastly two different things. And the way you answer that question is very important because it leads me into the next point. Because this point makes all the difference in your Christian walk. Because it will determine whether you come alongside Christ in his mission to reach out to the world, or if you're just going to separate yourselves from them like the Pharisees. Okay? And when we look at this, we look back to the story of Hezekiah. God is reaching out to Babylon. He makes this great sign in the sky. He's reaching out to Babylon to bring them to Jerusalem so that Hezekiah can proclaim God's mercy and compassion and love and healing. And also to demonstrate that God is, is, is the God of the universe. He's the creator of all. But Hezekiah failed to express this. And that's why this is the critical point. Our mission in the church is to join God's outreach to the world. To testify of God's goodness as he draws the lost. Because Hezekiah missed out on this opportunity to proclaim God's goodness and mercy and loving kindness. I mean, he neglected to tell the Babylonians why God moved the sun in the sky. Because he cried out to him. Because he said, Lord, have mercy on me. I've been serving you for so many years. I've been faithful. I've been trustworthy. Please save me. And God does it. He didn't even say that to them. That was no part of this conversation. Had he told them that, that would have pierced the hearts of those ambassadors. But he didn't do that. He just talked to them about his treasures and about his wealth. That's what he talked to them about. And here's the thing. You don't have to be a scholar, a teacher, a theologian, a minister, or anything to proclaim God's love, to share God's love. I mean, you can witness and testify of the power of God in your own life to those who may, have asked, may ask you of it. That's why we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he convicts the lost and brings them across our paths. He was bringing the Babylonians to cross the pass of Hezekiah. Hezekiah squandered that opportunity. Because his pride, he was more focused on himself and he wanted to look good in their eyes. Let me bring this to a close. We saw that God's sign in the sky moving the sun backwards in time was a sign to heal Hezekiah. But we also see that it was a sign to reach out to the Babylonians to bring them to Jerusalem so that Hezekiah could testify of God's goodness and mercy. Hezekiah missed that opportunity because of his pride. Do you see here how his conversation with them was about his treasures, his wealth, his riches? Hezekiah's conversation was something on a level that they could relate to. Because they were basically, they were worldly. They didn't know the God of the universe. All they knew was wealth, power, riches, fame. And that's what Hezekiah gave them. That was the conversation he had with them. In the same way, when we engage conversation with unbelievers, there's so many people who are looking for truth. They're looking for answers. And we, can, and we have the truth. And you know what our conversation with them is? Oh, can you believe the politics yesterday? Oh, can you believe what that politician said to the other politician? Oh, let me show you this. Let me tell you about the stock market over here. Or did you see that sports game? We're speaking with them at their conversation level. That's what they value. That's what they're looking for. The worldly things. The typical things that all the world is looking at and talking about. And that's how we engage our conversation. But I'm suggesting we can be just like Hezekiah. We can just talk about the things about what they know and what we know that are happening in the world and yet never talk about the heavenly kingdom that we are citizens of. Never talk about the love of Christ. Never talk about his grace and mercy and compassion and the love of Christ. 
That's what we need to weave into our conversations. Yeah, it's fine to talk about those things that are just standard, that the politics and the, the news of the day or anything, that's fine. But when they really want to hear, they need truth. They don't have the truth. We've got to bring Christ into the conversation. We, it's so important because God's mission is to reach and to seek and to save the lost. And when he moves in their hearts, that we have no idea when or where he's doing that, but when they cross our paths, our conversation should be such that it's different. It's different. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light. We're the city on a hill. That's what we need to do because God is reaching out to the lost and we need to join God in his mission to reach the lost. Yeah. <clears throat>